see it, this Saturn-sized world wouldn't look like anything in our solar system. To reach such a high temperature, astronomers calculate that its atmosphere must absorb nearly all the radiation from its nearby star. It's probably as black as this lump of coal. The only light from it would be the thermal emission from its sunward-facing hotspot. Cyclops may indeed look like a giant black eyeball with a glowing iris. I was just playing with this 3D solar system viewer. Um, you know, I'm under the impression that this Nibiru planet might just be out there. So, what I did here was, um, I'm just trying to figure out where it's coming from. Coming, coming close to Uranus, right? So we might not be able to see this thing until April. Let's move it back a bit, April 8th. See, there's Uranus. So if this little planet that we're, uh, we're all looking for um, is coming by Uranus, then we're not going to be able to see it. It's behind the sun, right? Let's move that. See, there's April. Let's go to a geocentric view. I don't have to telescope. Like a banana. Geocentric. See, there's Uranus right there. Let's turn it around. <coughs> a little bit of a lag here. High graphics. See where Uranus is? From our perspective, Uranus is over here. So that sun's really bright. We might not be able to see her until late April. We should definitely be able to see it well, what, by the end of April, right? Beginning of May. So I think we should all start looking. Well, don't stop looking. But we should all start uh, really looking beginning of May. If she's out there, we should probably see her by May, right? Of course, you know, chem trails and freaking clouding us out. Disinformation and hiding truth and it's, you know, what are you hiding? Why? Won't we all eventually know? I guess preparing for it. We don't want too many people to survive, right? Because, you know, we do have the Georgia Guidestones. They only let 500 million people should be here. I never wrote that. Some of the theorists say that Planet X is a planet. Whereas others say that Planet X is really a star. And on the Buru, a number of people claim that Nabooru is a planet. And yet other people claim Nibiru is also a star, or could be a star. There's this claim out there that they're two different objects. That Nibiru is the name of the star, and Planet X is the name of the planet next to it. Alternatively, some people say that Planet X is the brown dwarf star which is basically the small star with Nibiru in orbit. If we put the names to one side for now there seems to be the general consensus by the Nibiru Planet X theorists that there's a number of possibilities. There's a possibility of a star-like object and at least one planet, maybe more. It's claimed by some theorists that there are a number of planets around this brown dwarf star. Some people suggest that the legends of Nibiru and other gods of ancient times within Babylon and indeed beyond relate to some of these planets and possibly even the inhabitants of those planets. Some theories relating to the planet or planets which may be inhabited 
speak of UFOs and alien abduction, as well as the ancient accounts of gods being connected to the inhabitants who come to Earth to collect resources whenever that mini solar system is on a close orbit. Many people out there believe the basic theory that there's a planet out there with a very long orbit. Exoplanets, because they have the most extreme conditions we've ever seen. Their official names, HD 149026b and HD 189733b, are based on the catalog numbers of their host stars. Personally, I'm going to call them something unofficial but easier to remember. Cyclops and Storm, the hottest and windiest known planets. Both of them are so-called hot Jupiters, a class of gas giants like the outer planets in our solar system. But their orbits would fall well inside that of Mercury, and that makes them hot. It also makes their years short, taking only two or three Earth days to orbit their stars. Our first exoplanet, Cyclops, can be found in the constellation Hercules, orbiting a sun-like star that's about 250 light years away. Its day side is a blistering 2300 degrees Kelvin, according to infrared Spitzer observations made by astronomer Dr. Joe Harrington and his team. That's a lot hotter than the inside of a blast furnace and sets the record for known planetary temperatures. If we could actually see it, this Saturn-sized world wouldn't look like anything in our solar system. To reach such a high temperature, astronomers calculate that its atmosphere must absorb nearly all the radiation from its nearby star. It's probably as black as this lump of coal. The only light from it would be the thermal emission from its sunward-facing hotspot. Cyclops may indeed look like a giant black eyeball with a glowing iris. The Lowell Observatory was established in 1894 in Flagstaff, Arizona by Percival Lawrence Lowell, an independent businessman, mathematician, and astronomer. One reason Lowell founded the observatory was to study the planet Mars and its canals. The other was the search for other objects of interest in our solar system, most particularly Neptune's perturber, Planet X a fact that revisionist historians downplay or paint over. Yet it was Lowell's intention to find the mysterious Planet X that led to the discovery of Pluto. In 1929, 14 years after Lowell's death, a young astronomer by the name of Clyde W. Tombaugh was retained by the Lowell Observatory to carry on the search for Planet X. And on February 18, 1930, he discovered Pluto. At the time, astronomers believed he had found Planet X, Neptune's perturber. Consequently, the topic of Planet X languished for some time after Tombaugh's discovery. However, after the discovery of Pluto's moon Charon in 1978, it was determined that Pluto lacked the mass to be Neptune's perturber, as it is only about 60% the size of our own moon. So with that, the search for Planet X was once again afoot. It's also interesting to note that Pluto was later demoted to the status of a dwarf planet in 2006 by the International Astronomical Union. In 1950, Emmanuel Velikovsky published Worlds in Collision, and he was viciously attacked by mainstream science, even though he corresponded frequently with Albert Einstein. What generated this medieval response from modern science is that Velikovsky used ancient accounts to question the Darwinian notion of evolution with evidence of periodic cataclysms caused by large objects flying through the core of our solar system. Despite ruthless suppression, Velikovsky's work 
reawakened an open discussion of Planet X, and following that, a steady trickle of interest emerged, both in mainstream science and the media. On March 3, 1972, NASA launched the Pioneer 10 spacecraft to explore the outer planets. However, according to government whistleblowers, the real purpose was to find Planet X, or at least to help narrow down the search field. An interesting aspect of Pioneer 10 is that it also carried a small gold anodized aluminum plaque designed by astronomer Carl Sagan should the spacecraft be found by extraterrestrials. At present, communication with the Pioneer 10 spacecraft is no longer possible. Following the launch of Pioneer 10, the topic of Planet X would have languished again had it not been for Zachariah Sitchin, the author of The Twelfth Planet, which was first published in 1976. According to his translations of ancient Sumerian texts, a race of beings living on a planet called Nibiru bioengineered early hominids on Earth to turn them into slaves for the purpose of mining gold. Called the Anunnaki, these beings lived on a planet the Sumerians called Nibiru, what we call Planet X today. And the Sumerian accounts tell us that it orbits our Sun every 3600 years and flies through the core of our system, often causing great cataclysms on Earth. Sitchin's translations and theories are corroborated by an ancient wisdom text called the Colburn Bible. And according to Planet X historian Greg Jenner in his book, Planet X and the Colburn Bible Connection, previous flybys of this mysterious object caused the sinking of Atlantis, the Deluge, and the Ten Plagues of Exodus. Although Sitchin was continuously mocked and attacked by fundamentalists, our government took his work seriously and on January 25, 1983, NASA launched the Infrared Astronomical Satellite, IRAS. Its mission was to map the sky using infrared. According to NASA, IRAS was unable to complete its mission due to a failure in its supercooling system, and much of the data collected from the probe was classified and has never been disclosed. Several government whistleblowers say that this was a cover-up because NASA shut down IRAS after it imaged Planet X. Their accounts parallel an article published by the New York Times on January 30, 1983, shortly after the IRAS launch. Evidence assembled in recent years has led several groups of astronomers to renew the search for the 10th planet. They are devoting more time to visual observations with the 200-inch telescope at Mount Palomar in California. They are tracking two Pioneer spacecraft, now approaching the orbit of distant Pluto, to see if variations in their trajectories provide clues to the source of the mysterious force. And they are hoping that a satellite-borne telescope launched last week will detect heat signatures from the planet, or whatever it is out there. It is important to note that the term Planet X was also used to refer to a tenth planet. However, after Pluto was demoted to a dwarf planet in 2006, that definition became irrelevant. But what is relevant is what IRAS imaged and the consequences of those observations. In a Victoria Advocate article published on June 14, 1988, NASA astronomer Dr. John D. Anderson was quoted as saying that telemetry from the Pioneer 10 spacecraft indicated the existence of Planet X. Also note that this article was sourced from Google News and was featured in Yowza.com's March 2012 article titled The Planet X Cover-Up in the Mainstream Media. Following publication of our article, 
the entire June 14, 1988 edition was deleted from the Google News site. However, a complete copy is available for Yowza.com subscribers. But what is relevant here is that Anderson is a NASA astronomer with one heck of a resume, and what he said in that 1988 news article was powerful. In that article, he said, We have a 90-99% to 99 confidence that Uranus and Neptune are being disturbed, and by one candidate for that is a single Planet X. At that point, our government became more interested in keeping public attention focused much closer to home. After all, if you can't see it, it's not there. So go back to sleep, America. Nothing to see here. However, a few curious minds had other notions. On October 1988, Dr. Robert S. Harrington, the chief astronomer for the U.S. Naval Observatory, published his paper, The Location of Planet X, in the Astronomical Journal. In an August 30, 1990 television interview with Zachariah Sitchin, Harrington also said that Pluto had been a satellite of Neptune, but it was dislodged by Planet X, which he believed could possibly sustain some form of life. He also showed Sitchin a diagram he had created approximating the location of Planet X. Following that interview, Harrington commissioned the construction of a special telescope for a Planet X photographic sky survey in 1991, which was completed at the Black Birch Observatory in New Zealand. The New Zealand observations were performed using Harrington's calculations, and the results were sent to NASA. However, those films vanished and have never been seen again, which leaves us with a big question. Did Harrington actually find Planet X, Neptune's perturber? In 1992, Sitchin produced a documentary titled, Are We Alone in the Universe? At the end of that film, Sitchin quotes a NASA press release from that same year. Unexplained deviations in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune point to a large outer body system of four to eight Earth masses on a highly tilted orbit seven billion miles from the Sun. I mean, if, if, we, if we discovered that uh, you know, space aliens were planning to attack and we needed a, a massive buildup to counter the, the space alien threat um, and really inflation and budget deficits took secondary uh, place to that, um, this slump would be over in 18 months. And then if we discovered, whoops, we made a mistake. There aren't actually any space aliens. So we need aliens. Orson Welles be a better, what you're saying. No, that's a, that's a, there was a Twilight Zone episode like this in which uh, scientists fake a, uh, an alien threat in order to achieve world peace. Well, this time we don't need it. We need it in order to get some fiscal stimulus. You to vote on the news. And here's the winner. There's a huge, hidden, heavenly body right here in our solar system. Evidence is mounting that either a brown dwarf star or a gas giant planet is lurking at the outermost reaches of our solar system, far beyond the planet Pluto. According to the British newspaper, The Independent, the object is four times the size of Jupiter. Experts say the presence of such a massive object could explain why a barrage of comets has been coming from that direction.
God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come behold the works of the Lord was made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. So, three, you're on the air. Uh, you're talking to Crew 14, and I thought I might give the listeners uh, an eyewitness account of what was seen. Uh, basically, we've been following this thing since February. And uh, when I uh, talked with Astro Patriot and I first saw the first video that he showed uh, had this huge wave of radiation and orbitals were popping out. Uh, and I didn't really want to believe it, so I went and bought a scope, a Mead LX200 8-inch scope. And it took me basically until May <laughs> to get it up and running and figure it out. Uh, we still didn't quite have the kinks of the camera part out, but we were able to get some viewing. Right on the uh, 29th, 30th, and 31st of uh, May, it basically was motion motionless in the constellation of Leo with Regulus as the dominant star. And the alleged comet is over to the left. Over to the right, right around Regulus, there was this huge uh, sort of black area. Uh, black area such that every now and again it would move over, cover Regulus, and you could see the light from Regulus bending over the edge of uh, what we now know as the gravity well. You could see the light bending over their fingers, and then it would move away and you'd see Regulus as a point in the sky. After studying this for some time, I noticed over on the right-hand corner of this this dark area, a uh, little red orbital coming out in a bit of a squirrely figure of eight sort of pattern. About then, I started to look up at uh, 12 o'clock and I saw two more uh, orbitals that popped out. They were white. And then I started looking all around this area and then over to the left, there were two that were blue that sort of popped in and popped out and popped in and popped out. Also, just underneath here, um, at about six o'clock were two more um, white objects or orbitals that were popping out. Now what's interesting about this, the French, I can't think of the name of their team, but on March 3rd and March 5th, they took a video of this movement across the sky and it showed all the orbitals. After that, they only showed pictures of the single solitary comet. They didn't show any more uh, time-lapse films. All they did was point to the one area with the comet, and what you really wanted to see was over to the right of that. Uh, they didn't take any more pictures of that. I'm sure they saw it. They just didn't take any more pictures. In any event, it scared me so bad that night on the 29th, I immediately called... Uh, I immediately spoke with Carol and one of the uh, other members of, of our group. 
And uh, actually, I could, uh, not to mention it or anything at that point, um, I was actually frightened. So the next night, which was the 30th on a Sunday, I thought, well, I don't believe what I saw. It's not real. I'm going to just forget it. I'll just take a look again. And it was still motionless. And unfortunately, it was still there. The orbitals were still there. The popping out was going on. And this, you know, I became even more frightened. And, and also, I was still a bit in denial until finally on the third night, I said, I'll forget what I saw the last two nights, and I'll look again this time on the third night. And on the third night, exact same thing. It was still motionless. The, the orbital cloud, I don't mean the orbital cloud, but the gravity well was still bending light over at Regulus and then moving where you could see Regulus, the red orbital was still coming out doing a real squirrely orbit. The two on top were there, the two on the left and the two on the bottom. And, you know, at that point, uh, I, I couldn't convince myself of what I, that I didn't see what I saw. I'd seen it three nights uh, in a row. It didn't go away. And the consequences uh, of that have caused me to make uh, urgent uh, changes in my life and my habits and so forth. Uh, by trade, I'm a physician uh, slash amateur astronomer slash uh, archaeologist and a number of other things. But my main uh, occupation is a physician. I have my own practice, etc. And I've been doing this for 25 years, so I didn't start yesterday. Um, you know, it's, it still makes me tremble to think about what I saw. And then, you know, as time has passed on, we're getting more evidence, uh, more volcanoes are going off, more earthquakes, a 6.7 near the east coast of Japan. They say it's in the sea, and, and it says it's near the east coast. That's bad enough, but the earthquakes have picked up, the volcanism has picked up, you know, and the weather modification, the changes we're having, and we're getting to a point. Uh, it's a bit of serendipity, as, as, as Tara alluded to before, my calling uh, this particular person and finding out, oh, well, he's getting calls from China, he's getting calls from folks in Arkansas, telling him to come right away, not explaining it to him. And I just happened to call because I sent him an email, and I said, hey, I said, you know, I really don't need these, you know, it's not the money, I'll buy something else. And then he got curious, well, well you know, you're in Missouri, he said. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, what do you need with, you know, Arctic sleeping bag? And that's when I told him about Ellie, and then it sort of, uh, I guess he had an epiphany, a click as to why um, the Chinese were urging him to bring his entire family, but not telling them why. Same thing with the group in uh, Arkansas, telling him to come, and they'd given him basically a three-week window. that it coincided with the 7th of July and the crossing of Saturn's orbit. Uh, you know, my time frame was uh, still and still is August 1st, but I'm getting more anxious by the day. Uh, and so uh, folks need to know this is real. They need to wake up. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm past the point of trying to wake anybody. Uh, at the Paiute Indian, the cliff dwellers, and the problem with them is the elevation is too high. You don't want to be that high. You want to get out of that area. There are four or five volcanoes in New Mexico, and now I'm going to blow up and towards that area, so you don't want to be in that ash fall out. There's a volcano that just, uh, I want to say, about, it wasn't a volcano, we had an earthquake in Arizona today, about a 3.3. I hadn't seen that recently, so. You know, a number of things are going on. This is unstoppable, it's unavoidable. You cannot escape it. You must seek shelter. and then continue from the chat room. Uh, I want to know if you're talking about Planet X or Elenin, and I don't think, I, I've never thought Elenin is Planet X. Uh, Terrell's pretty, yeah. pretty well, stuck on that, but is. I think Elenin is a result of it. It's a comet that's been it, kicked it, in. 
Elenin is extinction level event Nebulu is near. Right. Does that explain it? estimated that this thing is traveling around 3,500 miles an hour, okay? Okay. That was our estimate of its speed. Now, it has been picking up speed, and that's the reason why we think it's going to arrive early, because when it comes around the backside of the sun, it's got to double that speed in order to attain breakaway speed to leave the sun and not wind up orbiting it. It's never orbited the sun in the past that we know of, so that means that it's going to have to attain breakaway speed to head back out into space. Now, you look at the NASA videos, photos, and all this other crap that those morons put on the internet. This thing is coming in. It's going to, as soon as it goes around the top of the sun, it's going to go back out into space. Right. And it's going to do this really fast. When it goes past us, it's going to go past us so fast that we'll almost have no time to get ready. That's my opinion. But, you know, just drawing it out on paper a few times and thinking about it, and I went... You know, if this thing picks up enough speed to make breakaway speed, then that means it's going to come past us. You know, this thing, according to uh, what I was told, is that this thing is approximately 47,000 miles in diameter, uh, you know, four or five times the size of the Earth, and it'll come past us, and we won't have a lot of warning, and we won't get to see it in the sky until it's on us. I think the NASA timeline is completely off. I think this thing is going to arrive much earlier than they say it is. You know, I know they're saying October, but, uh, you know, if you look at the, you know, now, I was told that the poles are not shifting at 42 miles a year. They're shifting at 42 miles a day. And the reason is, is because this planet is rolling over to face this thing. Now, when it goes by, it's not going to push our North Pole away. It's going to grab our Southern Pole with its Northern Pole. And it's going to be like somebody kicked this planet in the ass. That earthquake that it talks about in uh, Revelations uh, when the opening of the sixth seal comes. From what I've been told, that's very accurate because that's exactly what's going to happen. There's going to be a massive earthquake when it locks onto us. As it goes past us, we're going to follow it right upside down. The oceans are just going to be roaring from pole to pole, as you could well guess they would, because if you take a planet that's 7,000 miles across and roll it upside down in 30 minutes, you're going to have some real serious problems with wind and water. We should be preparing to expect this thing to show up again. That's what's going to happen. Hopefully nothing in this mess will hit us, even though it does say it will in the Bible. At least it does in my Bible. It says we can expect all kinds of problems. We were looking at asteroids right close to this thing. There's asteroids that are floating around right near the, uh, that are orbiting the, uh, the main sun itself. These things appear to be about 500 miles across. And, and as you go back into the tail, you get into meteorites that go back for millions of miles in the tail. This thing looks like a giant red teardrop-shaped dust cloud. And you can see, once if, you, if you're able to see it up close like we did, you can see every speck out there. I guarantee you there's trillions of meteorites falling.
Assumption Parish officials are testing newly discovered gas bubbles near the Bayou Corn sinkhole. Workers from the State Office of Conservation and contractor CBNI have taken samples of the gas bubbles to determine their source, although officials acknowledge the bubbles likely are connected to the sinkhole. Parish officials say the new bubble site in Grand Bayou is about one-third of a mile north of Highway 70. Scientists think the gas presents an explosion risk for residents, and that's why the area has been under an evacuation order since the sinkhole's discovery 18 months ago. It's about 700 feet wide, more than 150 feet deep, and it's growing. This giant sinkhole in Texas appears to be swallowing everything in sight. What might have begun as a crack in the ground has grown into something much more menacing. I'm going to go down with a ship. For residents in Dysetta, Texas, the sinkhole is taking on a life of its own. I've been through fires, I've been through floods, nothing like this. Never imagined we'd ever go through something like this. Geologists are still trying to figure out what caused the sinkhole and if there's any way to stop it. Officials say the sinkhole's growth has slowed overnight while local residents are keeping their sense of humor naming it Cinco de Mayo. This is Dabu 7, and you were looking where a drone had went down to the edge of the sinkhole and caught a lot of good footage here of the inside of the sinkhole, the depth. Um, I got it on the backup channel. I'll leave a link. Also has footage of everything going down and crashing through the floor. So I'll leave a link so you guys can check that out. And... Now we have a new sinkhole opening up. They've evacuated homes. Uh, Hemel Hempstead, 20-foot sinkhole opens up here under the road, right next to it. Huge hole opens up. Um, 17 homes have been cleared, and they sent these people out of there. They, want, they wanted everybody around completely out. And as you can see here, it's approximately 30 foot wide, 20 foot deep. With this guy standing. I mean, that shows a pretty good view of it right there. But, you know, they have a good point. They're saying that they're trying to blame this on the weather. And that it's because of all this massive flooding and, and water and all that that they're seeing all this. But they're saying that, hey, we've been seeing this before this. So, regardless, I wanted to update you guys. Another huge sinkhole opens up here. Um, all that had to do was give way right where he's standing and people are dead driving along that road. So, be careful. Uh, eyes on your surroundings at all times. Y'all stay safe. I'll leave links. Till next time, it's been Dabu7. Peace. The most powerful earthquakes in the history of the United States happened along the New Madrid Fault in 1811 and 1812. Those earthquakes were reportedly felt more than 1,000 miles away. Scientists assure us that one day we will once again see very powerful earthquakes along the New Madrid Fault. It is only a question of when it will happen. Today, the New Madrid Fault zone covers portions of Illinois, Indiana, Missouri, Arkansas, Kentucky, Tennessee and Mississippi. However, a major earthquake of magnitude minus 8.0 or greater would likely have a dramatic effect all the way from the Great Lakes all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. When most Americans speak of the big one, they think of what may happen along the coast of California someday, but the truth is that a New Madrid earthquake could potentially do far more damage. So is there evidence that the New Madrid fault zone is waking up? Yes, there is. According to Bloomberg, there has been a six-fold increase in the number of earthquakes that have shaken the central part of the United States from 2000 to 2011. Much of that increase is being blamed on human activity such as mining, drilling and fracking. So could human activity aggravate the fault zone so much that it could set off a truly history-making earthquake at some point? Well, the potential is certainly there. That is why so many people are so concerned about the monster sinkholes that have appeared in the region in recent months. For example, a massive sinkhole down in Louisiana is now over 8 acres in size and it has forced hundreds of people to flee from their homes. You can see video of the Louisiana sinkhole right here. 
Over in Ohio, a giant sinkhole has suddenly formed that is more than 30 feet deep and that is the size of four football fields. That sinkhole caused part of State Route 516 to collapse and authorities say that it will likely be closed for many months. You can see video of the gigantic sinkhole in Ohio right here. Are these monster sinkholes an indication that major earth changes are coming along the New Madrid Fault? Has reckless human activity awoken a sleeping giant that we should never have messed with? The sinkhole down in Louisiana is a particular concern because it has been venting natural gas. A few days ago it reportedly burped which sounds kind of ominous. Could we see some kind of an explosion at some point? Many of those living in the area may not be able to return to their homes for quite a long time. The following is from a recent Huffington Post article at the 8-acre, Bayou Corn Sinkhole in Assumption Parish. Owners of slab houses are waiting for methane gas monitors to be installed in December. The sinkhole deepened in November and coughed up debris and hydrocarbons late in the month. Cypress trees fell into the gap. Residents are watching natural gas being flared from the site and are ventilating homes, while bayous around them bubble. But if human activity is capable of producing sinkholes that are eight acres in size and capable of causing a six-fold increase in the number of earthquakes in the middle part of the country, is human activity also capable of setting off the New Madrid Fault? Sadly, even most Americans that are living in that part of the country don't really understand how incredibly massive and how potentially destructive this fault zone actually is. The following is from a recent report from WREG in Memphis, Tennessee. Many people don't realize that North Alabama lies in the impact zone of the New Madrid Fault Line, a sleeping giant that is approximately 20 times larger than California's famed San Andreas Fault. The biggest earthquake in the United States history happened in the New Madrid Seismic Zone in 1812, and in just the last few weeks, activity along the fault line is starting to heat up. If the earthquakes that happened along the New Madrid Fault Zone in 1811 and 1812 happened today, the devastation would be unimaginable. Back then, there were not that many people living in the area. But even so, the destruction was incredible accounts of the 1812 quake very since there were no measuring instruments at the time, but most geologists say evidence shows it was at least a magnitude 8 earthquake, and possibly a 9 or higher. The shaking was so intense that church bells started ringing as far away as Boston and New York. Chimneys toppled from the deep south to Canada, and President James Madison was awoken by the violent shaking, as he slept in the White House. Eyewitnesses said it even caused the Mississippi River to flow backwards for a time. Unfortunately, there are now indications that the fault zone is becoming more active as a recent Examiner article explained Tuesday evening, two shallow earthquakes, although small, were felt in Mount Carmel, Ill as well as five miles outside Edmond, Oklahoma, Illinois had the largest at 3.6 magnitude, leaving Oklahoma with a smaller 2.9 magnitude quake, as reported by the USGS. The fact that both of these quakes were shallow and follow on the hills of Kentucky's 4.3 just 10 days ago makes the questions begin to fly. Is the new Madrid waking up? Is it gearing up for the big one? When Key experienced a 4.3 two weeks ago, it was felt across 10 to 12 states. Although it didn't knock runners off their feet, it did alarm many. Knoxville was among the cities that felt the quake. The shaking was not minor in many areas and it scared people, as walls shook and many began to pray. This is something that I have written about previously, and we all need to keep our eyes open for more reports about earthquakes in the middle part of the country. When the big one does finally hit the New Madrid Fault Zone, it will be one of the biggest news stories ever. We are talking about a catastrophe that would be so immense that it would be hard to imagine. According to ABC News, a study by the Mid-America Earthquake Center found that in the event of a major earthquake along the New Madrid Fault, nearly 750,000 buildings would be damaged, 3,000 bridges would potentially collapse, 400,000 bricks and leaks to local pipelines and $300 billion in direct damage and $600 billion in indirect losses would occur. You can read much more about the New Madrid Fault right here. All of this is even more frightening 
when you consider that there are 15 nuclear reactors along the New Madrid Fault Zone. In the event that the big one strikes, we could be looking at Fukushima times 15. We have been blessed to have avoided a major earthquake like that for so long in the middle part of the country, but there is no guarantee that the New Madrid Fault Zone will always be stable especially considering how much it is being aggravated by man-made activity. There are even some that believe that eventually we will see an earthquake of magnitude minus 9.0 or higher along the New Madrid Fault. Such an earthquake could literally change the face of the entire continent. We are talking about an event that could potentially change the course of the Mississippi River and create bodies of water where none existed previously. We seem to be moving into a time of increased seismic activity on the Earth, and many scientists are convinced that the New Madrid Fault Zone is definitely overdue for a major earthquake. If there's a blue pill and a red pill, and the blue pill is half the price of the red pill and works just as well, why not pay half price? Massive sinkhole and bayou corn are inches away from seeping into the freshwater bayou. A protection levy built to keep that material in the sinkhole is sinking. This is Adrian Pittman gets answers on what could happen if the protection wall gives way. Assumption Parish officials fear the break in the berm could cause major environmental damage in the area, leaving them on high alert. Another year and the same problems in Bayou Corn. It's a little bit frustrating that, you know, all this time has elapsed and uh, here we are, we're still, still worried about the sinkhole. A growing sinkhole, continuous seismic activity, and cracks in the protection berm around the sinkhole. There's still a lot of things going on way below the surface of the earth where we can't really tell what's going on. Uh, if that south berm is still subsiding, still cracking, that means something's happening down below. Since last week, activity along the sinkhole has stopped because increased amounts of micro earthquakes. Because of those small quakes, the protection wall is dropping into the sinkhole. Into the sinkhole. At this point, you would think we'd have a clearer picture in our mind as far as what to expect expect in the future, but uh, that future is still uh, very cloudy right now. Since October, the run has dropped a total of four feet, and within the last week, it's dropped a foot alone, leaving residents and officials here in Assumption Parish concerned. The subsides itself is only about six to eight inches above the water currently. Meaning salt water could eventually creep into the swamp and bayou if nothing is done. Take a look at these pictures. You can see how much the berm has sunk since last week. Uh, environmental risk to vegetation, trees, uh, possibly uh, fish and so forth, and try to avoid that, by, and that's what the containment is for. But residents will remain hopeful in 2014. We hope for the best. We hope we can bring some conclusion to this, but I really think the sinkhole itself, we're going to be dealing with, with that, I think, for years to come. A spokesperson for Texas, Brian, says crews will begin repairing the berm tomorrow, and there are plans in the works to extend the southern berm so it won't continue to subside. Adrian Pittman. They had taken the earthquake monitors offline. But this was interesting. Human rights defender Senator Fred Mills believes that it appears Assumption Parish, Salt Dome Sinkhole, is becoming another ongoing man-made Lake Penure, Penure, Catastrophe, a government-supported oil and gas industry genocide through poisoned water, according to his interview Sunday by Deborah Dupre. Mystery gas bubbles plaguing Bayou Corn, sinkhole area, are also increasing at Lake Pinier. I think I'm pronouncing that right, maybe not. 80 miles west of the sinkhole. Okay, but what I'm going to play for you now is this YouTube video. It's only approximately 10 minutes long, Lake Pinier's oil rig hits a salt mine and causes mayhem. This video gives an excellent and thorough background of what happened in 1980. It's, it's obvious that while we can't understand much of what is going on today with all of these catastrophes, all of them, BP oil spill, um, the Louisiana sinkhole, all of the tornadoes and the snowstorms. No, because man is lying. The lying is so pervasive in our society that we can not get to the truth any longer. What is also very clear is that corporations are destroying Earth. They are destroying planet Earth. 
and there are cover-ups in every catastrophe, and the citizens of every country are denied access to documents, they're denied access to meetings, they're denied access to the information that they need to protect themselves and their families. When did you first notice these sinkholes? Well, when that hole started getting bigger, and then once I removed the rock and I cleaned off the uh, garage floor, mm -hmm. and I noticed where the water was going, it was making a hole that kept getting larger and larger, mm -hmm. and as time grew on, that's been maybe within the last uh, three months. Okay, let's go look at that one in the garage again. Dramatic pictures out of Ohio this morning. Take a look at this. It's of a sinkhole where it swallowed up a car while it was traveling down a busy street. Officials saying the sinkhole was at least 10 feet deep. Rescuers had to lower a ladder down so that the driver could eventually climb out. Now